Hello everyone, uh, my name is Paul Stevens and welcome to this short-term rentals webinar on digital transformation, driving the end-to-end -end guest experience through AI, sponsored by Key Data and Logify. So I'm the editor of Short-Term Rentals at International Hospitality Media and I'm the host for today's session. Before we begin, uh, let's introduce our first webinar series sponsor, Key Data, a data provider for the short term vacation rental industry. And we've got a short video for them. It's actually helped us increase our revenue because what it allowed us to do was look at, for example, as an example, a two bedroom property in a specific area and look at what the, the benchmarked ADR is for that and what the occupancy is. And we found that in some areas, our ADR was actually less than the market average. Big thank you to uh, Key Data for sponsoring uh, this session and our webinar series. And now we've also got a uh, second uh, sponsor, Logify, and I believe we've got a video for them too. Try Logify and increase the revenue of your vacation rental business. Create your bookable vacation rental website, select a template, upload your rental information, and share it with the world in minutes. With Logify, you can connect to booking portals manage all your reservations, stay in touch with your guests, and automate time-consuming tasks. Go to Logify.com and grow your bookings today. So a big thank you to Logify for uh, sponsoring this session and our series as well. Now, Logify is also announcing a very generous offer of 40% off uh, professional and ultimate yearly plans and free onboarding. There's no discount code, so all you have to do is uh, find more details on screen and in the chat. So please uh, do get in touch with the Logify team today. So uh, let's introduce our speaker lineup for today. And we're going to start, please, with Anila from our sponsors, Logify. Hi everyone, um, my name is Anila. I've been with Logify for three years. Logify is an all-in-one vacation rental platform for independent hosts and property managers. Here I lead a team of amazing product managers responsible for conversion and product activation. Super excited to be here and looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much, uh, Anila. And next up we have Nitin, please, from Merit. Hi everyone, I'm Nitin. Uh, I lead digital innovation and homes and villas product for Marriott. Uh, for the past few years, I've been leading homes and villas exclusively, and in my new role, I'm also looking at digital innovation. Very happy to be here. Thank you, Nitin. Uh, next up, we have Gilad, please. Gilad, Sorry, uh, <laughs> two years in, we're still muting ourselves. We are. <laughs> um, one day I'll get over that. So as I was saying, my name is Gilad. I'm based here in Seattle, Washington. I spent 15 years as a startup founder and CEO. And the last three years as a venture investor, I have a small fund called Brook Bay Capital. We focus on artificial intelligence investment within the travel and hospitality ecosystem. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much, Gilad. Now, we're hoping that Julie will be able to join us uh, from Microsoft. I know that she's been um, unexpectedly brought into an important meeting. So we're hoping she'll at least be able to join us for a little bit later. So fingers, uh, fingers crossed for that. So some webinar guidelines for today. All of the details are going to be posted in the chat throughout. So please do go there to ask any of our panelists a question. We'll have plenty of time for a Q&A at the end after our panel discussion. And then a recording will also be sent out to everyone within the next 48 hours. And before we begin, a bit of uh, context as well ahead of the, the discussion. So I recently attended SCIF's uh, Data and AI Summit in New York City, where, among others, Nitin, uh, Aguilad, and Julie's colleague Shane were all speakers. And you can also catch our roundup of the key AI topics discussed in our takeaways feature. And you can also hear from Homes and Villas by Marriott Envoy President Jennifer Shea about the brand's generative AI search tool. We'll be hearing a bit more about that from Nitin, I'm sure. 
We'll also be hearing from Anila from our sponsor Logify about the company's GPT powered AI assistant and how it is driving digital innovation and transformation through its products. The company also last year appointed its first chief AI officer um, and we're expecting to see a lot more of those sorts of uh, roles and positions being announced across the industry over the next couple of months and years. And finally, we'll also be evaluating the future of AI and to what extent we should be excited or wary about it. Um, we've got a couple of stories here you could see on screen now uh, about a sizable increase in AI-related uh, travel scams through booking.com and Airbnb's acquisition of stealth startup gameplanner.ai a few months ago. So we're very interested to see what uh, innovations Airbnb will be bringing to the market very soon. So let's get uh, straight into our discussion. Um, Gilad, I'm, I'm going to turn to, to you first. And you, you talk about um, you know, being an investor and a founder of Brook Bay Capital, you're an early stage tech in, investor in, in, in AI and machine learning. So I think you're, you're very well placed um, to, to discuss this first question. I guess people tuning in today might not necessarily be aware of the term digital transformation or innovation already. So what, do you, what does it mean to you personally at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the digital transformation process, obviously it means something different to each company, but at a high level, it is a process that large companies are undertaking to, to move from an old technology stack built in a different epoch of technology when things were not connected, were not smart, and transforming them and moving them into the current epoch, the current stack that we have. Some of the things that we've seen companies focus on are things like single source of truth, as we all know, um, most brands had customer data spread across the organization and not connected, which of course makes it very difficult to offer personalization, very difficult to do storytelling at scale, um, focusing on modernization, on consumerization, and on integration are typically the three elements that I pay attention to in this process. And consumerization is not just for actual travel to consumer, but also on the B2B side of our industry, whether it's dealing with property managers or travel advisors or GMs of hotels, really thinking about how do you consumerize this technology for any type of user. So while it's a high level thing, these are some of the things I think about when I think about digital transformations. And, and I guess from a travel and hospitality perspective, which we're here for as well. How do you think this is going to, one of a better word, transform the industry and how, how we think about it? Yeah, one of the things I focus on a lot as an investor and just as a, as a board member across a number of big companies in our space is the connected trip. And the idea of the connected trip enabling us to have a trip or some, some people would call it smart trip, even though I, I like the connected term better. Um, the idea that data follows a traveler throughout the entire journey. And when one supplier in that journey learns something about that customer that can make that traveler's experience better, a way for us to share that knowledge across the ecosystem. You know, I talk about the connected trip and the single source of truth for travelers as the rising tide that lifts all boats. Ultimately, if we provide better travel experience for travelers, they're going to enjoy it more, they're going to want to do it more, they're going to talk about it more. So it really is, you know, the rising tide. The problem, and we talked about this at Skift, of course, as well, is the fact that for a connected trip to work, you need companies that are semi to fully competitive with one another to find a win-win relationship in order for all of us to be connected through, through this connected system, through connected trip ecosystem. So that's something I'm really excited about. But like I say all the time, the challenge here is actually not the technology itself. It's really business incentives and culture within the industry that would allow us to bring that. But nonetheless, I think the digital transformation takes us a long step, a, a big step in that direction. Thank you, Gilad. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to address some of those challenges as well as we start to see this digital um, innovation landscape evolve. Um, I'm going to turn to, to Nitin next for, from Marriott. And, and Nitin, um, we know you from uh, working as a VP of digital innovation and on the homes and villas uh, by Marriott Bonvoy products since, since April. And that comes shortly after debuting your, your new generative AI search tool as well. But I guess what is your general understanding, Nitin, about digital transformation, innovation. What, what does that mean personally for you? 
in in context of Marriott, uh, Marriott is going through a quite a rapid uh, transformation journey. That is more to do with, I think, what Gilad said, um, a full revamp of systems that were built about forty years old, <laughs> which which have very limited capabilities. So you have all these ideas that you want to implement, whether it is connected trip, which I, I think is the holy grail for now. Um, but to get to that, you can't make 40 year old systems talk to these things the way they have been doing uh, so far. And so, so far, so good. And the only reason our travel experience uh, today, if you ask me, uh, the, uh, the technology now exists to do a lot of what we're talking about. But the only reason you still haven't seen it transform things in the true sense of the word transform is because the underlying bones are so old and, and they can't take that uh, speed that you want to move forward with, right? And the capabilities also. So Merit is uh, obviously investing very heavily as uh, you heard Drew speak in uh, the SCIF Summit as well on completely revamping. We have one of the first uh, reservation systems, online reservation systems, and we, st we still use the same one, by the way. So <laughs> it's not a good place to be. But the, uh, but the company is very serious about uh, uh, sort of coming out of that, which will unlock a lot of these things. Um, and as we move towards a more natural language being the new programming language world, basically, you know, your there is no so no no programmer will set what the query for your system has to be you yourself will say what do i want out of this system right and there are these different disparate uh, sort of siloed data pools or whatever no, the customer shouldn't care anymore the customer should say well i know how to code because i can speak in english or whatever language the system support and that is your coding language now you better give the customer or the guest whatever they said. So it, it is a true transformation, unlike uh, some things that we have seen in the recent past, that what the new technology unlocks is pretty much it unlocks your brain. And it, un it, it unlocks your brain to say, all right, what do you want? And you have never been asked this question, actually, what do you want, right? You have always been asked the question, where do you want to go? These are two very fundamentally different questions. And so uh, the, the other thing I'll touch upon, which uh, I, I think a lot about is what Gillard said, said about the trip intent is going to be the new king for personalization. Uh, because travel is a difficult beast in per se, because travel habits are very different. And, and you yourself are multiple personalities when you travel. Uh, it depends on the intent of the trip, really, right? So taking all your past data and sort of thinking what you would want for this trip, I don't think the recipe works anymore. Um, so uh, it's it's very interesting how the connected trip, well, borrow your term, uh, sort of concept is. But how do you first do within the silo of the, your company data, but then finally figure out, uh, because for the guest, why should your company data matter? And the trip is a trip, right? So there has to be this sort of cornerstone, what you're building towards. So it'll be interesting if uh, there are broader handshakes, at least amongst big players in the world, to enable that guest journey. And that will be very, very pro-guest. And in return, it will be pro-business as well. Yeah, if I could add just one thought here. I mean, I loved everything, everything he just said. And one of the things that we saw 10 or 12 years ago was the rise of a huge wave of social intelligent trip planning startups that were trying to take information from social media to plan your trip. But but just like um, Nidim said, it was not enough. You change based on the trip. You change based on who is traveling with you. You change based on where you're going. So we saw an entire generation of startups fail because they thought there was enough depth in that social data, which there wasn't. And I think the point being made is a really good one with AI. We really have to think about the depth of data. That's that's um, that's really interesting and, and, and knitting. Um... It sort of, I want to sort of follow up on on what you were saying there as well. Um, is this digital transformation? Is this an ongoing process, kind of without an end? Like how how sort of far away through do you think we are already? Are we at the start of this this crazy journey? I I think transformation like change is a constant, but that's not what we mean here. Uh, there's a step change to happen. And I think when most of us are talking about, we are talking about that step change, about coming out of legacy to the new. 
uh, and hopefully the new world uh, or, or the new systems you're building hold up for at least a, a few years. I'm just so skeptical to make that statement because every two weeks <laughs> I feel everybody changes everything now. So, but, uh, but, but so far our systems have lasted us 40 years, for example, right? The reservation system. I don't think there's a future of that unless the systems are so uh, sort of flexible in terms of you putting in whatever and you getting out whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how it's gonna be. Um, so the transformation I think that you have on your screen as a topic is the step change transformation, but technology changes, every day I wake up, it's changed, right? So I, I see that to be a constant and the rate of change is only going to sort of increase uh, because now machines are changing machines. Like all right, humans still needed to sleep and eat and do other things. But these things can work all day, all night long to bring bring about the change even faster, right? So I think this new human plus machine of annexing every human capability is in itself uh, a recipe towards a larger transformation change. But in an, in the next year or so, I do believe that the step change, most companies should have embraced the step change and should have laid down the foundation for the what this new world is going to be like. Right, and then you will see constant rollout of features that sort of uh, work more and more for your guest in that say in that sense. Thank you, thank you, Nitin. And it, this all ties in with with a poll that I put on uh, LinkedIn as well to to, to previous webinars. So um, we did it last week, and we've got some results here. So the question we put up was, "What is your overwhelming sentiment around the use of AI in travel and hospitality?" and really creating a memorable guest experience. And I guess when we're talking about this, this transformation, this chart could probably change completely in another week um, when, we're, when we're doing this, this poll and also depending on who you're asking. But in, in the, the case of uh, the people that we asked last week on LinkedIn, those who responded, 45% said that they were both excited and wary of AI. 35% said that they were excited about AI use and 20% uh, said that they were wary of AI use. And I know we were going to speak uh, about some of the responsible use of AI with, with Julie as well. So we'll we'll try and make sure that we, we get some of those, those answers. From Can I just so, add one? Uh, sorry, when I, see, when I see data, I start thinking about biases. And <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't know how else to see data. So um, you, you have quite a few keywords there. So one is the use of AI in travel and hospitality. But I feel when most people are asked this, especially the lot that's wary of this, I think it's not so much when they process the full term of AI in travel, mm -hmm. because travel AI will be pretty harmless, right? It's not that in future robots will take over and you will sit at home and robots do your travel. Like that's not the future here, right? So it, it, it's very human centric and even the worst case scenarios are not sort of the worst case scenarios. So I think a lot of pool of people who say they're wary of AI in travel are just skeptical about the overall AI when they think about, hey, are robots can take over and is humanity in danger? And so I, I would think that if truly the full term was processed as AI in travel, uh, I think less people, people should be less worried about AI in travel. Thank you. It's 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 good to it's good to have optimism and look forward with with AI and obviously lots of exciting innovations going on. I wonder, Anila or, or Gilad, if if one of you wants to come in and, and react to to those results that you've seen. I mean, I'm I'm happy. A, I completely agree that that if people think about AI about AI and travel, it's like, what are you scared of? Like, do you think it'd be a better recommendation, a worse recommendation? But but it's still a, a recommendation. Um, my sense of these surveys is that everyone should be in the both excited and worried category. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm a big fan of the philosopher Yuval Noah Harari, and he says about comparing AI to organic biology, he said, imagine the first organic organism showed up 18 months ago. Imagine humans or apes or monkeys or elephants, like, right? It's like, it would be impossible to imagine these creatures if we were literally a year into organic biology. That's where we are with this latest era of AI. So I think we should all be excited. We should all be wary. Um, so anyways, that's my category. <laughs> uh, and, and Nila as well, did you, did you want to come in here? I know you're doing some very exciting things with, with Logify. Yeah, I think it goes back to what Nitin said, the AI, that it's a stereotype of the robots are going to take over. And that's not really the case. And when you read this, the use of AI in travel, 
a lot of people don't really understand what it exactly it means. Um, so yeah, it's the bias again that mm. takes place. So, yeah. And that, that links to, to alludes to my, my next question, really, because you're sort of um, exploring these these different phases of of the um, overall guest experience. With um, you, you've come up with a, a, a system, shall we say? So could could you just explain a little um, to us about what each phase of the the guest experience that you found, what it entails, and how you would how AI is applied to, to each of those phases. Yeah, sure. And it's interesting that you just showed that poll and this is the follow-up because um, typically people don't even know AI is there. The AI is in the background doing its magic. Very rarely you're interacting directly. Like yes, ChatGPT is creating content for you, but in travel, it's typically in the back end. And um, I like to break the guest journey into three phases. It starts first when you start shopping for an accommodation and it continues to months after you've checked out of the rental. So guests typically start in phase one, which is the shopping around phase, my personal favorite, because there's a lot of cool things you can do with AI here, like smart pricing technology. At Logify, some of our users have opted into our smart pricing tool called Dynamic Pricing. Our solution is adjusting rates in real time, meaning all the prices that guests are seeing are set by AI and they have no idea. So based on real-time trends, competition, seasonalities, and other factors, we're showing them the pricing um, our models are. Once accommodation is booked, we move into phase two, which is the hosting phase. And there is a lot of AI-driven messaging here, providing personal rec recommendations for attractions, dining, activities, pretty much acting like your personal tour guide. And then once a guest checks out, we enter into the third phase and AI doesn't stop here. It continues to work because the second you leave a rental, you get a ping and a request for a review where AI can help you to create the content in that review and so on. So even months later, AI can still target you with a personalized incentive to encourage you to repeat a booking and get you back into that end-to-end -end, um, guest journey. So to summarize throughout the entire journey, AI is everywhere helping drive the guest experience. Thank you very much, Anila. I know we're going to talk about your messaging product a little bit later, and I know we've got videos and stuff to show you later, so we will get on to, uh, to that very shortly. But thank you for breaking up the, the guest experience into, into those different phases, because it's not necessarily, we don't necessarily always have the chance to reflect like that. And also, I, th I think it possibly comes that we aren't necessarily aware that as you say ai is operating in the background and has been for several years so um thank you thank you for those um those insights and um, i'm going to turn back to to Nitin as well because um we mentioned it in in the context slides earlier Nitin, about your your generative um ai search tool i guess how how do you see this powering the, the whole end-to-end -end guest experience and what were you ultimately hoping to to achieve with it when you think full funnel guest experience, you you got to start on the top is what sort of our initial idea was. Uh, when we were building it, we started with a chatbot, but that was because we thought generative AI works in a chatbot mode. And uh, so there was a lot of that hangover, which made us start in the bot. And But as we were doing that, some some key insights were very interesting, which is that by the time somebody has landed to your pro on your product, they already know the answer they're looking for. The answer they're looking for is a home rental, for example, right? For homes and villas. Now, if they if the answer is already determined, then why do you need the bot feature at that stage? Bot is more conversational. And then as, as product people, you also have to and it goes hand in hand with helping guests and, and the product and the business. We, we couldn't answer, is the bot too distracting in the booking phase? Like, did you have 20 minutes to book and did you just come and ask a bunch of questions and started reading and started fine tuning your answers and now you're out of time and then you never sort of get to what you wanted to get to and to, to begin with, right? And then travel, the other was that travel is so visual like everything you book is so visual. It's not a written recommendation for you to get a house. You want to see the house, right? And then over the over the last 30, 40 years, you are now used to a certain format of consumption, which your brain doesn't have to be taught. And so I'm I'm not a big behavior change fan unless there's a really big need for it, right? Behavior change is very expensive. 
um, and it takes a toll on the guest in short term as well. Um, so when we thought of all those things, so we started, we said, all right, for end-to-end -end journey, once again, going back to what Gilad was saying as well, for end-to-end -end journey, you need to know the intent of the trip. And what better way to capture the intent of the trip than to start with search, right? Because you yourself will come and say, hey, for this trip, I want this. And, and that intent is now much broader than you saying, I want to go here. Four of us could be wanting to go to New York next weekend, and each each one of us could have a completely different intent to go to New York. And each one of us could be looking for a very different product to, for accommodation to go to the same destination. So destination box in itself is not enough to know intent, basically, right? Now, if you start with that, then uh, sort of a little microcosm of what Gela was saying, which is more complete, but a little microcosm of that would be then, hey, fine. So now you know why somebody is traveling instead of where are they going. If you know the why, then everything everybody's speaking about, whether it is guest communication that we are going to enter, whether it is what kind of properties you're going to be recommended on the top, right? And then the middle, let's say post booking scenarios, the pre-arrival scenarios, the in accommodation scenarios or in stay, right? And then the post stay scenarios. If somehow you can handshake the intent throughout that, that is where the magic happens. And that is where the guests will feel for the first time that I have been taken care of in a much more enhanced manner than how it has been so far. And it's not enough for us to get on these calls and talk about how great AI is, um, but the true, but, but the guest has to feel it, right? And until you un get to that feeling stage, what will make the guest feel it is when I think it is a connected experience throughout. And, and they, they genuinely feel that they have either saved time or somebody understood them or anything that was said to them made sense. There was no cookie cutter messaging going on, which they filed in the spam cabinet all the time, which didn't mean anything, right? So I think when you connect all the dots is when I think the true magic will be felt. Right now we are building pieces of that magic, right? So uh, I think a little patience and it's gonna be a very interesting world. What do you think's fueled that that shift towards the the traveler intent now, or or is this is this even a more recent shift? Um, it's yeah, it's interesting what you say. I I I think from the guest perspective, nothing has changed. If you ask me, the guest always had the intent to travel. The guest never had a place to share that intent because what would that sharing do if it doesn't get me the right answer back basically, right? So our systems were so constricted that we are not now asking humans to change the way they think about travel. We are saying, hey, don't change the way you think about travel. Come in and say it exactly the way you think now, right? So is it behavior change? I don't think it is because now you're going to the core behavior. Behavior change for me was, what has happened in the last four years where I, I'm i sitting here, it's cold, and I'm saying, man, I, I all I want to do is go someplace warm with my kids on the East Coast of the US maybe, right? Now that is how the raw thought emerges for travel. And now the behavior changes that now I need to go figure out which are the warm places because that box will only take the name of a destination. So I got to do all the crystallization of that thought in, in other places or in my mind. And then I got to come to these boxes and say one by one, try 10 different destinations mm -hmm. and see which one is fit for me, right? All we are saying now is don't do that work. Because again, when you do that work, you end up picking the big destinations that you've heard of and, or that some blogger has made SEO content for and is ranking for, right? What about all those beautiful small towns and places and remote areas whose name you never have heard or you don't know? But guess what? They did have the warm weather. They did have beautiful secluded beaches if that's what you wanted, right? You will never be able to come up with those smaller places and put them in that box. But now you could just come in the box and say, hey, I just want to go someplace warm with my kids. Make, make it on the East Coast and I'm done. And now let's see where we can take you, right? So I, I think it's reversal of behavior change if you ask. <laughs> yeah, if I can interject here, I mean, there is so much wisdom in what he just shared. There's a few points that, that are really, that I'm very passionate about that I want to underline and, 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 and build on. 
So first, to the point of the purpose of the trip, that's not new, right? We've always had a purpose of the trip. And I've always said, sometimes we spend a lot of time thinking about that purpose. And sometimes it's given to us. I'm going to a family wedding or I'm going to relax on the beach. But that purpose always existed. So when I started Utrip, which was the world's first AI trip planning company all the way back in 2011, the very first question we asked a traveler before destination, before dates was, what's the purpose of your trip? Now, we did it in this kind of static way. We had six or eight options because, of course, it was a different era of technology. But the whole point, if we know the purpose, relaxation, exploration, business, connection, whatever, everything else flows out of that. So I thought that was a really important point, and I completely agree. There's nothing new about consumers thinking about the purpose. They've just not had a way of getting value by sharing that. Now, another example that he used that I love is the idea of destination recommendations, so not only because when you say, I want romance and red wine, there are other places other than Venice to go and experience romance and red wine, but also if either you're price conscious or sustainability conscious, one of the best ways to fight back against over tourism is for us as an industry to tell new stories. The reason we all want to go to Venice is because we have the story in our head of going in Venice and the canals and how beautiful and romantic it is. It is. I love Venice, but there's other places in the world that also have canals, that also have romance, that also have great wine. And if we do the storytelling, which is where Gen AI actually can be quite helpful, then we both support these destinations, but also support sustainability. Um, and then just lastly, at the beginning of the comment, again, I so agreed with, with, with what he said, is we talked about using the right tools. The travel industry is lives in physical space, and Gen AI does not live in physical space, but things that computer vision do. So I often tell companies when they talk about Gen AI, that is just one tool in the toolkit. There's an entire toolkit, an AI toolkit that's been developed, that's been commoditized over the last 18 months. So don't limit yourself to just Gen AI. It has amazing use cases, of course. But computer vision, collaborative filtering, all these other things are incredibly powerful tools. So anyways, I agreed with all of that, and I just thought there's a lot of wisdom um, within yeah, you've raised a lot of uh, interesting points there. Over tourism is something that we are covering an awful lot of perceived. And the vacation rental market can actually help here. You yes. know what I mean? The fact that vacation rentals are so dispersed as opposed to hotels that very often are in, you know, city centers or hotel centers um, is another impact that this part of the industry can have in a positive way. And uh, even, even just just thinking today, we, we've, and I don't know if my team in, in the background will be able to bring it up, but we've covered a story today about a, a local discovery app called Bigfoot, which has been um, created by former uh, employees of, of Airbnb. And now we've seen that they have made an acquisition in November or December of um, Game Planner AI. And we, we mentioned it on our, contact, on our context earlier. And they said that they left Airbnb because they didn't have the resources to create this, this product there. So I, I guess we're seeing a lot of these sorts of trip planning, AI powered apps now. Do you think there is space for all of these to um, get out in, in the market? Yeah, and let me, I will answer that, but let me push back against the point they made at Airbnb. It's not that Airbnb lacked resources. Airbnb is a highly resourced company. It's that Airbnb was focused. So when I started Utrip in 2011, I got a meeting with Rich Barton, who founded Expedia and many other successful businesses. And he was very kind and told me that the trip planner we had was the best trip planner I ever saw, but he would not invest. And I said, well, help me understand, why would you not invest if this is the best one you've ever seen? And his point was that these were too far away from a transaction and too far away from the core vision of what they were trying to do for Expedia to monetize. And he literally said to me, the smartest people at Expedia were focused on increasing conversion rate in Las Vegas by one tenth of 1%, which at the time equaled about $100 million in top line revenue a year. Um, so my point is, it's not that Airbnb wasn't resource enough, it's that they made a decision, probably the right decision, um, to focus on the core business. Now, to your actual question, um, my answer is kind of mixed. You know, what's difficult about trip planning is that, like I said before, it's historically very far from a transaction. And historically, startups and companies that have benefited from trip planning have not benefited from the revenue or the commission share from the transaction because consumers tr transacted elsewhere, whether directly on the hotel website, through an OTA, through a travel agency, et cetera. So that's been one of the challenge. I think there have been a, a very large handful of great trip planners created over the years. 
Um, and none of them have successfully built B2C businesses. Now, what we did at Utrip, of course, was pivoted from B2C to B2B2C. And that's where we found success, licensing this technology to, you know, Hilton and Marriott and all these large players who already had traffic and customers um, coming in. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and room for B2B and B2B2C trip planners. On the B2C side, it's very hard. You have to ask yourself, what kind of customer acquisition mechanism do you have that is so differentiated from what all the other people who've come before you have tried that it's going to allow you to not only acquire travelers, but acquire bookers? One of the challenges trip planners have is the good ones have a lot of people who play with them. We did this in, in Utrip's B2C era. We had lots and lots of engagement, positive NPS, reusage, like dwell times, all, all the good metrics, just no conversions, just no revenue. Um, so anyways, that's one of the key challenges. Now, to be optimistic, I think there's a lot of opportunity for these guys if they go smaller. I say this all the time. If you want to use Gen AI to disrupt Expedia or TripAdvisor, it's very hard for me as an optimistic person to come up with a story of how that happens. But if you come to me and say, I want to start an OTA focused on hiking in the Pacific Northwest. I live here in Seattle. All of a sudden, you may be able to have proprietary content. You may be able to have proprietary data. Maybe if you're really niche enough, you can even have some proprietary inventory. All of a sudden, that becomes a really interesting business. Not necessarily for me to invest in as a venture investor, because I can't invest in niche or regional businesses. I'm looking to invest in, in national or, or ideally global businesses. But who cares about venture capital? You can have an amazing business built around a local OTA, a local trip planner, a local digital travel agency. So I'm a huge believer in the space. And I think if founders can have self-control and most of them can avoid venture capital, they can build some really nice businesses in the space. Because of course, in travel, we have an endless number of great small and medium businesses. We just don't have very many large businesses businesses that you know succeed at scale thank you Gilad and um, we did have a really interesting question from Caroline at home to go Caroline be patient I will, we will get around to that question that's really good and I was hoping that Julie was going to be here to, to answer that but we will get around to that um I think uh, we've, we've sort of touched on it a little bit already but I, I really want to touch on the sort of storytelling aspect as well with, with trip planning and um, Anila, you're, you're, you're perfect to talk about this with, with your new AI uh, messaging product. So please just sort of explain a little bit and, and what you're hoping to achieve and problems to solve. Yeah, so I can do that for sure. Um, do you want to put up the AI message assistant so we can actually show people what is our AI message assistant? Absolutely. Let's get up there. We've got a video and a slide. Here we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so our main focus with this product was solving for the time and effort it takes to manage guest messaging. And as a product manager, I've noticed that it's so tempting to just jump right into AI. But the tools and product who deeply understand their users' problems are really disruptive in the market because without healthy product adoption, you can't drive digital transformation. And now time for the story. After initially launching our AI message assistant, it didn't go as expected because we noticed after the release hype, our adoption dropped and became stagnant. So to put it simple, people weren't using it. And you can see that in the graph here in the first few months. And it wasn't until after we talked to hosts that we found out why. We learned that hosts loved fast responses, but it was not all about speed. The generated messages didn't capture the host's unique voice and often misunderstood their intent. Our AI would say yes to early check-in requests when guests wanted to say no because somebody was currently at their rental. So with this feedback, we made two key improvements. First, we incorporated the host tone of voice. And what does this mean? Messages now reflect each host style. So for instance, Cindy, a super host managing a ranch style rental in Texas, sends messages that sound like her, not like a robot. And the second thing we did was we implemented a quality score. So by understanding the context of previous messages and incorporating aspects of the host business, we ensured to um, capture everything going on and ensure that the messages sent were actually accurate. So the AI said no when it was supposed to say no and vice versa. 
These changes made our AI more personalized and effective. And the graph shows our adoption rate with a significant lift in January when these improvements were released, doubling the adoption rate. So this increase really highlights how we have driven digital transformation through this AI system for our product. And I guess, um, you know, are there any key takeaways that, or, or things that you learned as well through um, your, your use of research from, from this? So I guess it goes back to the very first thing I said, it's, it's so tempting to just jump right into AI and start just throwing it and plugging it, it in everywhere you can. Um, we need to spend more time in the problem space to really understand the problems that users are facing so that when we do plug it in, we plug it in with the right criteria, with the right features, with the right weights, um, incorporating aspects that make it actually um, effective. Mm. Thank you. I Thank think you what she said is so important, and I have spent time with a lot of companies, and they mostly miss this critical point that she just made. AI is a tool. It is not the end. It is not the product. It is not the objective. The objective is whatever you're wanting to offer your customers or for the business. And AI is a tool, so I completely agree. I mean, far too many people jump to the end and say, I want a gen AI tool. I want a chatbot. I want whatever without spending time in the problem space. So I think what she said there was, was critical. And... Um... Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much, Gilad, as well for coming coming in there, and and uh, Anila for that that really interesting breakdown as well. Um, Nitin, you're you're doing some really interesting things with, with Marriott too. Again, again uh, linked to this around natural language search. How how are you finding that is unlocking value for your customers and and maintaining this sort of seamless personalized experience? Um. I think sticking to the theme because I agree with uh, everything that that has been spoken pretty much. You, I don't think AI is also for everybody at all times, because you, you know conversion sounds like a more of a business metric, but remember it's also a guest metric, because that means the guests found what they wanted, <laughs> right? And so, I I take conversion very seriously. Obviously, you have to. Um, when when you think of that, I don't think AI is for everybody at all times because the muscle memory of last 40 years of how you book by using a destination box is here to stay. And I think has benefits even in future, right? So for example, if I know I want to go to New York and I want to stay in Times Square and these are the dates, there's nothing I'm really trying for AI to do. I may be more price sensitive and I want to do my search in, in the way I know how to do it and pick the best hotel I can from the top three for five choices and be done with it, right? Now, AI unlocks different use cases if I don't know where I want to go, right? And now instead of doing that research outside and coming up with a destination name, I can just use that raw thought and save time, right? Now, the second is if I know where I want to go, but I want something very specific. I want a house with, I'm going with my kids and I want, to, I want a house by the beach with superhero theme room, right? Now, no website will give you a filter called superhero theme room. Now, hence, what do I have to do to get to that, right? I have to open up every property. I have to see which one has it, right? Now, it, it helps you save time when you want things that are specific in nature also. So depending on what you want, and, and, and the one thing I really liked is, I think as people are thinking about just putting another AI product out, the distance from transaction is a very important metric I would sort of ask them to consider. Uh, any company which has the product in hand, which they want to sell, also now has the capability to put a trip planner on it or whatever else they want to put on it at the end point. As a guest, where would you go? Would you go to somebody who has just given you a recommendation and no path to book, right? Or would you just go where you know you can buy the product? You can just buy it in your own way. So some things you have to think about and consider, and I, I'm a startup guy myself at heart, so I, I, I have a lot of respect for everybody who does these hard things called startups, right? But I, I think the, the sheen has to come off from the hype cycle of saying, Anything I touch that has the word AI will get me investment or whatever else uh, is the goal. It's a short-term goal maybe, right? Or will give me a sustaining business. And the core focus has to be what is the offering itself? Like, do you have something to offer? And all AI, and I'll oversimplify Gen AI for, for at least what, that's what I do. Then I'm able to think more clearly 
on is it required or not. All it is, is it has changed the coding language to English. That's that's all it is really at the end of it, right? I can just ask things differently now. But end of the day, you have to have something to answer and to offer, right? And so uh, I think th those key principles sort of <laughs> at least my guiding, guiding stones. But what's fascinating is with with Marriott as well is, and, and I heard it in, in New York a couple of weeks ago, is the real attention that you've got to testing your concepts and products as well. So whether it's like the, the natural language search or um, I know you're also sort of venturing into these sorts of categories as, as well, a bit like Airbnb has. Um, why specifically the homes and villas side? Why is that so important for the, the testing aspect? When we started, like any big company, see, see you, you can't disrupt a multi-billion dollar engine. It's just not done, right? So as startups, you have way more freedom to do crazy things, uh, but not as very big, stable, reputed businesses, right? Now, but what do you do? You also want to keep up with the times. You also want to move along. You want to do the right things for your guests. But conversion is paramount because any small change in it is hundreds of millions of dollars, basically, right? So how do you go about it in a, in a bigger in a big enterprise like this, right? So I think the way Marriott approached this has been very, very interesting. Now, Homes and Villas was, was fundamental because the guest profile of the Homes and Villas guest is the same as Marriott Bonvoy guest, right? So it's the same guest. However, the exposure is much smaller because this is not the mothership. And so you get to experiment or introduce something to the same guest in a pocket which is uh, risk controlled, right? And now you have suddenly the ability to use this system as a lab. So where you can get the basic, we did not have answers to basic questions when we started. For example, what is this cost per word model, right? How much will it be? Can it scale? Can it not? How disruptive it is? Where will the technology sit? You can ask very basic questions. We had no idea about the answers when we started, right? Now we do. And even and, and then the questions on conversion were completely done. Nobody on this planet could tell you what impact AI is going to have on conversion for your ecosystem of guests, right? Now, where do you get those answers? You get those answers by actually putting something out. Because no consultant, nobody's going to come and tell you what the truth is. Everybody's trying to figure it out, right? Now, when we thought of those things, we said, all right, so we have the same guest profile. And the product of Homes and Villas is very interesting because homes are not standardized entities, right? So there's something unique about every home that you go into. So it, it also lends to a much larger pool of customization or specifications that you might want. And hence, the product itself is ripe for people to sort of use natural language to get to what exactly they want. And then we want an insight into, hey, what do you think about these things when you come in, right? All of this was in the category of unknown. And even uh, you brought up categories as well. There are predefined categories. Now, once again, why does Airbnb or anybody else have, uh, not picking on anybody, or because we do as well, why do we have uh, set categories because that is how our existing data, what it allowed us to do. But why should you have set categories? Every user for every trip intent should be able to declare their own category that you should assemble on the fly, right? That is the hyper-personalization. If I want a cabin in the woods, which has blah, 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 and is on top of a tree or is has one door or no windows or whatever the heck I want, right? That is my category, basically. Now, in, in the world of AI, do, do you need categories? I, I don't know, right? <laughs> Maybe we do still. That's, that's a whole other question. <laughs> Correct. Because every, every AI prompt to me is assembly of a new category, basically. Right, you 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 just you just oh, so I know I've repeated this quite a few times, but that's just I can't get over this thought. All you are doing is you have given people an ability to write SQL queries or whatever queries your database is run in in English now, right? And every each one of those queries is understandable by the machine. That's all that has happened. So uh, this I think we are in a super highly customization world now where. We people will be able to ask whatever and get whatever back. Thank you, thank you, Nitin.
Um, a, a reminder, please, to everyone and tuning in today, please do uh, post any questions you have in, in the chat. We've got about 10 minutes left. So um, I will get to uh, Caroline's question, a really, really good question here. I know Gilad and, and Neela have, have answered it as well, but we'll, we'll get them to expand on their um, answers, hopefully. Um, curious to know from the experts, do you think companies have a responsibility to tell customers when they are interacting with AI? such as in a chatbot or dynamic product feature that provides personalized results. So Gilad, uh, you, you typed in a, a response there, but would you like to expand on that? Yeah, so in addition to what I do in kind of the professional part of my life, I serve on the board of a think tank as well that thinks about AI ethics and AI development and responsible AI development. And through that, we spent a lot of time thinking about this. We've even actually worked with, with uh, both the Trump and now the Biden administrations on some of their AI efforts. Um, and the answer to me is there's a lot of really hard questions about AI. This is not one of them. To me, demasking AI should just be something that we do. We should just accept that when we're using AI, especially in a chatbot environment, I think it could become a little fuzzier if you're talking about an image that had AI you know, enhancement, because then you ask a question of like, where does traditional Photoshop stop and where does AI start? I think that's a little bit of a harder conversation. But certainly if I'm talking to a chatbot, I should know if this is, a, this is a human I'm talking to or a machine I'm talking to. And then there's also interesting kind of more complicated questions below. If you're using a chatbot that is not an obvious sales chatbot, like so if you're on Expedia.com or Marriott.com, like, you know that the AI is trying to help you and trying to help you buy inventory from those companies. But if you're using a Gmail chatbot, for example, or any other kind of what you think of as a neutral, or even we go all the way down to open AI chatbot, but it's somehow being paid to promote, you know, a certain type of product. I think that should also be disclosed, but I will say the counter to this, when you're talking to a human salesperson at a store, Again, maybe store is a bad example, but the point I'm making is you talk to human people all the time without them having to be forced to disclose every incentive and every compensation scheme in their life. So I often like to say, you know, why would we expect something from AI we don't expect from people, which is why I think these conversations are hard. But if it was up to me, I do think if a neutral seeming chatbot has some sort of financial incentive, I think that too should be demasked. Can I just add? Sorry, Anela, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Just add on one thing super quickly. In terms of the um, pricing tools, there are boundaries. When you set up and you plug in a pricing tool to your rental, you set a min and a max. It's not the AI going crazy, inflating the market, moving everyone's prices. Users are or hosts are controlling the max that they can go for and the min. So there are boundaries. Just to put that out there. And I'll say from, from the Institute too, one of the regulations we recommend for is um, human operator responsibility. You know, so we we jokingly call it the AI ate my homework should not be an acceptable excuse. Um, and at the end of the day, the AI should have some operator, a human or an entity or a corporation or whatever, and the liability should still rest with them in the same way that the liability rests with the corporation if their employees do something or whatever. And Nitin as well, did you want to come? I I also think it's in the best interest of companies to do so. So, for example, when I uh, when we were building our product, right? So we we renamed regular search to destination search, and we call this one search with AI. Now we could have very well said flexible search or something else, which wouldn't have mentioned the word AI. But we were going to be outputting recommendations where, when you use a search, when you when we recommend a city to you. We say, hey, you should go here because, and then that we have AI generate that because basically, right? Now, there is a lot of work that companies like us have to do in terms of safety protocols. Like what happened if you say something really bad in that search? And we, so, so reputation management is very important to us, right? And we end up saying something that is unsavory, for example, because your question was unsavory to begin with. Now, you do as a company want to de-risk yourself also from all of that. Now, hence, I don't think it's in your best interest to hide that this is AI because a guest is much more understanding because they also understand how the technology is evolving. It's not a perfect technology. It does hallucinate, right? Hallucination is sort of like a feature and not a bug in this case, right? And now if you don't say that this is by AI, then hallucination has come from humans, which make it worse. 
So I I am all for full transparency in terms of wherever AI is being used. Just say it. It protects you as a business as well. And of course, you all have lawyers who will take care of your TNCs for you. But <laughs> but in, I think transparency is good. So if I can add one area that I think is very complicated and difficult for us to think about, it's essentially the area of inspired by. So I like kind of by coincidence end up giving a fair number of AI talks in LA during the writer strike last year. And I had a lot of questions about the topic of inspiration. And this is one that we see a lot in travel because you know every travel writer has read hundreds or thousands of articles by other travel writers and been inspired by those. Every travel photographer has looked at thousands or tens of thousands of photos from other photographers and been inspired by those. And none of us have a problem with that. But when we begin to write articles, create imagery with AI, we do. And again, I think this is a difficult question. I don't think there's like a super obvious answer to what the right thing to do here. But as we create content, this is where I think we get into much more difficult terrain. Thank you. Thank you, Gilad. Um, we, so we've heard a lot of the sort of topics and, and, and key points around AI and digital transformation. Let's let's finish on, on, on a positive point. Um, Anila, I'll, I'll give you the, the last word here. Um, what are you most excited about within um, your space, within AI or, or some of the products that, that might be launching uh, with Logify soon? Yeah, so I recently spoke with our chief AI officer, Marco De Gregorio, and future innovation really hinges on building trust and making users feel secure with the technology. And when users trust our AI quality, we can actually do really cool things like suggest actions based on their behavior and their tendencies. So an opportunity we see for the future is automating responses for specific scenarios, shifting away from manual messaging to fully automated actions. Um, if our AI system can predict what's the most likely next action a user is going to take after receiving a message, this would be game changing for us. Thank you very much, uh, Nina. Um, qu quick word, maybe I'll I'll, I'll let Nitin um, finish us off, actually. Um, Nitin, what, what are you most excited about, very quickly, about the, the future? Oh, boy, I'll give you a non-answer <laughs> for that. Um, I'm excited for humans to travel more and more. Some of our best memories, or some of my best memories, are of travels with my family and friends, right? And so... I, I hope there is more and more travel in everybody's life and travel just makes you happy. And I, and, and in terms of connecting the dots here, I hope AI plays a role in making those travels more joyful, right? And easier and less stressful and, and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, the, the happiness, your happiness is not gonna come from using AI. Your happiness is going to come from time spent with family and friends when you are on these travels. So I hope there's, I, I wish and hope there's a lot of that for everybody. What, a, what an uplifting way to, to finish. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to all of our speakers today, to Anila, to, to Nitin and to Gilad. And we'll make sure that we um, we uh, get those questions over to Julie as well. It's a, a shame that she hasn't been able to join us, but um, we'll, we'll get around to her for sure. Um, so we've got a couple of slides just to finish up before we uh, we close off for today. So our next regular series webinar is on Tuesday, the 17th of September. We're going on a, a slight break over the summer, and that session is going to be on M&A vision, who, what, where, when, and why. Uh, you really don't want to be missing that. We're lining up some more top caliber speakers as well, and the sign up link is in the chat now. Uh, you can also check out the recordings for all of our previous webinars uh, on our website, uh, and the link is also in the chat opportunities to work with us please do contact my colleague whose details are on screen it's a great time to be working with us whether it's on content on events uh, podcasts and of course webinars like this big thank you to logify as well you can see their their generous offer um, again on the on the screen now and in the chat uh, the session we're going to keep this open for just another two minutes all of the details from the chat so if you want to drop down our contact details or our speakers, then, then please do. Big thank you to Key Data and to Logify for sponsoring uh, the webinar and our series. Thank you to our amazing speakers. And of course, thank you everyone for tuning in today. See you all again very soon. Thank you very much, everyone.
Thanks for Hello, having we are International Hospitality Media, or IHM for short. IHM is the number one brand to engage with decision makers in hospitality and real estate. Our four multimedia brands lead their respective sectors with breaking news, comments, trends and opinion across a variety of multimedia solutions. We provide an inspirational community to connect people through world-class events, webinars, podcasts, award schemes and much more. But let us share our story of who we are and what we do. Over 10 years ago, Pierce and George had a light bulb moment to provide expert opinion, comments and low-cost digital content. And so they went on a journey over the past decade, creating media platforms to serve the hospitality and real estate industries. We now have an engaged audience with a reach of over 60,000 monthly visitors across our website, 48,000 of our email database across all the sectors, and over 67,000 across our social channels. Everything we do believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. We make things simple and very easy to work with us. And we're a friendly bunch too. We offer creative solutions to help you achieve your business goals. Read, watch, listen, meet. With IHM, contact us for a chat today. Just look at some of the brands we have worked with recently.